have any videos. <laughs> Mark chapter 12. And we're carrying on for our brother uh, Dale that carried on, or left off rather. And I'm going to do this in chunks because uh, as we go through it, uh, I, I may not be able to get all through Mark chapter 12. So let's just uh, look at Mark chapter 12 and verse 13. Last week, of course, uh, or last time rather, when Dale was uh, speaking, he uh, spoke about the, the wine dresser, uh, the vine dresser and the like. But uh, we're going to carry on here. And I want to read that 13 down to 17, first of all. And it says, uh, Then they sent him, some of the, the, the Pharisees and the Herodians, to catch him in his words. And when they come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care for about no one. For you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it, and he said to them, Whose image and superscription is this, or inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to him, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Now this is, uh, as we go through this, this, this portion here, you're going to notice something that I picked up on, and I didn't, uh, and I looked at a few commentaries, and I never picked up on it, but I, I saw that uh, he's being tested by the, the so-called religious elite. And there's various ones. We have the Pharisees, we have the Herodians, we have the Sadducees, and, uh, and also the, uh, what was the other one, the scribes. So we have the, the various uh, uh, groupings of people here, and they have one thing in common. They didn't like the Lord's message. And uh, they, they didn't like each other, but they didn't like the, the Lord even more. And it was, a, it was a very interesting thing to have every, each one of them were coming to sort of have a go at him. And each one uh, met with a total failure. But uh, we look at the Pharisees, for instance, now, the, uh, who are the Pharisees? You know, we, we read about these things and we're looking at scripture and we wonder, who are these people? And I want to bring some light to uh, that. Well, the Pharisees, uh, these were, uh, these adhered to the letter of strictness of the law, uh, but they also had some added transitions, uh, traditions rather, not found in the law of Moses. They were strictly a sect, and uh, they, a, a member was called a chaper, or the, the word actually means united, and were, they were obligated to remain true to Pharisee, Phariseeism, and uh, they were moral zealots and self-denying, but they were also self-righteous destitute of a sense of need of sin and uh, and the, the need that's involved in that, and that, of course, is salvation. And Luke chapter 18 and verse 9, I want to look at that for a moment, and, and we can uh, see that uh, what we're talking about here, because this is a, a prime example of what the, the Pharisees were all about. I'm going to be looking at different scriptures, but uh, as we look at uh, chapter uh, 18 of Luke and verse 9, we see that this short version of story here. He says, also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, that's what we're talking about here, and the other a tax collector. And these, these are the despised people in the, in the nation of Israel. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like these other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as this tax collector. And as a tax collector stood afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Here's a clear example of, of the attitude of the Pharisees. They, this, is, this was their, their, their whole attitude. They were not, they don't talk to me about uh, sin and, and uh, salvation and things like that. That's... That was the problem that they had with the Lord Jesus. When the Lord Jesus came, he told them all that they must repent. They must turn to him, acknowledge their sin before God. And uh, how, how do you tell somebody who's so self-righteous that uh, he needs to repent of his sin? And this is, this is where the, the, the rubber hit the road for these uh, Pharisees. Now, the, the question in, in, of all, in all of this is, is uh, 
uh, we're going to see in verse 14. Uh, he says, when they come to him, they said, teacher, we know that, you, uh, by the way, I'll, I'll just go into what the Herodians are, are like too. Now, the, the Herodians uh, uh, were another group, and we see them in here, and this is the Herodians actually that we're talking about. And the Herodians were a political party of Jews who supported the dynasty of Herod and the rule of Rome, now, which, which, which would go right against what the Pharisees believed. They, they are remembered for only are mentioned only three times in scriptures, and that's in Matthew uh, chapter 22, Mark 23 and 6, and of course right here. These were lax in morals and in religious observance and were detested by the Pharisees. However, these two opposing groups joined together to destroy Jesus and tried to trick him once they realized that Jesus was a common foe. And this is what we see with the, the Herodians. And this is the Herodians that are speaking now as we look at them. And the question of tribute was a live one in Israel. It, 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 tribute simply means pay taxes. Uh, so it, to pay this tax was a tacit acknowledgement, of, of course, of the Roman authority. And that's one thing they did not want to uh, recognize. They were very proud Jews, and, and their uh, traditions and all the rest of it went far, far beyond anything that uh, any conquering uh, country could do. So the Jews just hated this tax, but the Herodians felt otherwise, hoping to find some special favor from the Roman authorities and find a way of accusing him of sedition or, or turn to the Jews, turn the Jews against him. So this is what they tried to do, and of course, what we see now is is the uh, what they, they they come up with. They say, well, uh, and this is this is one of those nudge nudge wink wink kind of a uh, we got him now. This is a gotcha. They, uh, they said, do, do you regard the person, you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God and truth. And then they, then, they, then they unload on this one. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? I thought, we got him. This is the, we got him in a corner now. Uh, what's he got to say? Of course, we're talking to the Lord here. And uh, it's, it's amazing how people think they can, they can uh, somehow do, do this. They felt that he was in a, in a, a no-win situation. And he calmly asks for a coin, a Roman coin, a denarius. And, uh, and then, he, then he says, uh, uh, why are you questioning me? You know, they thought that they were pulling a fast one. And of course, he knew, he could see right through them. He knew exactly what they were up to. They were trying to trap him. So he asked this question. It kind of put, it puts them on the defensive right away. Oh, well, we're not doing that. Well, yes, they are. And then uh, what does he do then? He, he, he shows them the, this, this coin, and he, he looks at it, and he, he says, uh, um, we are to obey the laws of the land. And the, the Romans, I just want to look at Romans for a moment and uh, just give an, an idea of what we're talking about here. Romans chapter 13 <coughs> and uh, verse 1. And now this is Paul writing, but it's, uh, this uh, principle is still the same and, and all the way through Scripture. He says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no other authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authorities? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, avenger of, to exude wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. And then he says this, according to what we were just talking about here. For because of this, you pay taxes. For they are, who are our ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs are due, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So now we see, we see the principles that are applied here as, as he's talking, these, talking about these things. So he, he, then he asks about the image. He, he says in uh, uh, verse uh, 16, he says, so they brought it and he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? And they said, well, Caesar's. And then he answers and said, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Wise answer. 
an answer that can only come from the living God. So what, what's hap happening here? He says, well, this, 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 this coin bears Caesar's image. That re represents the, the political authority that's in the land, and you're responsible to obey the, the, the political authority. But then, then in, in, by implication, he says, and whose image are you? You see, we bear the image of God. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 36, you know, we, we, what do we hear clearly says? And God said he created man in his image and in his likeness. So we are in the image of God. So what, what do we give responsibility to? Well, we have authorities over us, so we, we, in, in that case, we, we uh, obey those authorities. But because we're in the image of God, we bear the image of God, and that, that therefore their, their heart and thoughts and everything else should be towards God because they're in the image of God. So you could simply say, in whose image are you? So, you know, that's a, that was a tough question for them. And, uh, of course, I can imagine what they did. They turned around and headed down the road, probably kicking rocks. They pretty, weren't very happy about the, the, the outcome of that. They thought they had them. But uh, they began to realize the wisdom that came from this one who was called the Christ. So we carry on. And in verse... Uh, 18 it says then some Sadducees now we have the Sadducees coming who say there's no resurrection came to him and they asked him saying teacher Moses wrote to us that if a man man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children his brother should take up his wife and raise up offspring for his brother now there were seven brothers the first took a wife and dying he left no offspring and the second took her and he died nor did he leave any offspring and the third likewise so the seven all the seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife shall she be? For all seven had her as wife. So here, here another loaded question comes, <clears throat> comes, it comes at them. And we see right now here, we see, now we have, a, this is an obviously made up situation. You know, how often would this happen where you have, a, a woman married seven times and in all that time with seven husbands does not bury, bear children. But <clears throat> nonetheless, this is, this is a, a very, married, and the, the whole idea here is the perpetuating of the family line. And of course, what they're trying to do here, the Herodians, is trying to, or the Sadducees rather, is, is try to uh, um, ridicule the whole subject of the resurrection. Now, in the, in, the, in the resurrection and, the, and all the rest of that's involved in that, I just, I just wanted to just for a moment look at the whole subject of who these guys are, these Sadducees. And uh, <clears throat> as we look at them, we see the Sadducees were a Jewish sect that denied the existence of angels and other spirits and all miracles, especially the resurrection of the body. Uh, and they were religious, uh, religious nationalists at that time. And were strongly entrenched in the Sanhedrin and the priesthood, so they they had they had a, a, a prominent place in the in the Sanhedrin. The Sadducees are identified with no affirmative doctrine, but were mere deniers of the supernatural. They didn't believe in resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in anything. Sounds very much like those people that come around or used to come around on Sunday, Saturday morning and knock on your door. They didn't have a doctrine to give you. They just they were there to deny all the, all the principles of, of the scriptures. So, and this is exactly what they were. But this, this is, and they, they were trying to ridicule the whole subject of the resurrection. And of course, resurrection is what we're, we're all about, isn't it? We're, we're looking for the resurrection because he died and rose from the dead. And we being in Christ, we shall rise also. So here we, here we have them coming in. And uh, it, as I said, all these, all these sects were just trying to have a go at him, just see if they, somehow they could... Uh, uh, somehow uh, bring him down. But now we see that the, 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 the Sadducees are trying this as well. And uh, what do we see in all of this? Well, uh, first of all, I said that this whole situation is a made up situation. This, this, this would be an impossible situation to, for it to happen. And I hope we understand, we don't have to go into Deuteronomy and explain what, what the principle behind all this is. God made provision for those especially the women. In those days, of course, the women didn't have the rights and privileges that they have today. And if they were left without a male in the family to uh, perpetuate the name, to carry on with the heritage, the inheritance and the heritage and all the rest of it, 
uh, they were sort of left out in the cold. And they desperately wanted to have a family. They wanted to have a son. And the son would carry on, and of course they would be looked after, and, and so on. So this is this was the whole privilege, uh, premise behind all of this. But what they were, what these were trying to do is saying, well, this this doesn't happen because people don't or don't aren't resurrected in the, in the first place. So the Lord goes goes through all of these things, and then he then he says in verse twenty four, and he he, he simply says, uh, uh, you know, you're an error, you're wrong. Not very, not very good to tell these people who thought they had a, a real handle on the scriptures. He, he just said, you're wrong. You don't need, he says, are you therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? That would be a real slight to these people. What do you mean we don't know the scriptures? You know, this is, the, the, we hold by these scriptures. But he, he points out very clearly that this is, this is not the case. And he says, but concerning the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses in the burning uh, bush passage how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. You notice he didn't say, I was the God of all of these three. He says, I am the God. What does that mean? Well, it simply means that uh, these men still exist, they still live, and uh, he is the God of, of these. And so the, 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 their ignorance of scriptures was was manifest in, in these things. They profess to hold the scriptures as, as uh, being sacred, but they've denied the power and the might of God. And if they only knew the scriptures, they, and you see, they recognized only, only the, the book of Moses. That's, that was the thing that they wanted more than anything else. So what, is, what does he do here? He, he quotes from uh, the book of Moses, and, he t and this is actually from Exodus, to show when, he, when he, God was speaking, to uh, uh, Abraham, he said, or "He said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken." So this simply means that these men still exist in in the resurrected form. Uh, we know that we Moses and Elijah appeared to the Lord in the transfig transfiguration. We know that uh, in the, the book of Revelation, there's going to be two witnesses rise, and they, they're believed to be Moses and Elijah. So these are men that long, long ago passed from the scene, have decomposed in the grave and all the rest of it, and yet they still live. And uh, this would be a, a, a real tough one for them to understand. But they held to the scriptures, and that's what the scriptures said. So what are they going to do with that? So he puts them to silence. So he, in, in a, then, he, then he goes on further and he, ta he talks about something else too. He says, uh, when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Oh, so what, what's going on there? Well, you, you've got this idea somehow that things are gonna be perpetuated like as, as they are in here on earth, but uh, that's not gonna happen. See, they, they thought the soul of men died with the body, that was annihilation. That's what a lot of people believe. They th somehow think that uh, when we die, that's it, it's the end of us, everything turns to black and we're no more. Because that's not the case at all, according to scripture, is it? Uh, we will still be uh, viable souls uh, with the same ones that we've always have been, only our physical bodies will uh, be different. Uh, so they would, they would die physically, but they'd be alive to God. But when they do rise, they won't take up the same conditions that they knew on earth. In other words, there, there will be no uh, marital state. Uh, they'll be sexless, uh, like the angels. Uh, their distinction between men and women will be done away with. And for all these reasons, he, he appealed to, two, to the two great reasons. He says the Bible teaches it, and it rests upon the power of God. To ask how this is possible is to attempt to bring God down to their level of understanding. So we have a... Uh, something to look forward to. You know, I know we're married to our wonderful wives and whatnot, and we think somehow, well, that isn't, that's, that's not going to, but it's going to be better. Now, I don't know how it's going to be better, but it's going to be better. And uh, that's that's what we're looking forward to. It's going to be, you know, how my wives and, and husbands squabble and things like that. Well, it's not, none of that stuff going on in heaven. It's going to be totally different. And our, our relationships are going to be much different as well. 
And uh, we have a hard time doing, dealing with that because we only understand the kind of relationships that we have here, don't we? We got women, we got men. By the way, there's no other, there's only men and women. I just want to make that clear. And uh, the relationships we have with one another are, are, are confined to here on earth, but in, in glory, it's going to be so much different. And this is what the Lord's talking about here. It's going to be different. Somehow you think that they're going to go up there and, and she's going to be looking around over which, which one of these guys that she wants for her husband. No, it's not gonna, that's not the way it's going to work. Besides that, the whole thing was made up in the first place. But nonetheless, this is, this is the, the point he's trying to, trying to make here. And then he, <clears throat> then he goes on. Then now we have the, 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 uh, the scribes coming along. Now, who are the scribes? Well, the scribes, we can look at, uh, if I can look at for a moment at, at who the scribes are. I have a, a notes in my Bible. This is what I'm going back to these for because uh, they, uh, they explain who these guys are. And I would just, it's much better that I do. that they, I read this and I try to explain it myself. Now, the scribes were so called because of their office to make copies of the scriptures, to classify and teach the precepts of the oral law, and to keep account of every letter in the Old Testament writings. Such an office was necessary in the religion of law and precept and was an Old Testament function. They, they, we have the scriptures here now because of the scribes. They made sure that every dot and every tittle was, was, was laid out. We don't have somebody's thoughts here. We have God's ab absolute uh, inspired word in front of us. And the, the scribes made it uh, like a religion to make sure that everything was written down exactly the way it was dictated in the first place by the, the Holy Spirit. So in the Lord, our Lord's time, the Pharisees considered it orthodox, that is the, what the scribes wrote, to receive this massive writing which had been superimposed and had obscured the scriptures. So what happened is, they, of course, they, they were adding things to the scriptures, uh, the, the Pharisees were, uh, to make things a little bit more difficult. We know that this took, takes place in modern so-called religion and Christendom today, where we have things added to the word of God, things like purgatory and uh, reverence of Mary and, and uh, all sorts of things like that, which have absolutely no place in scripture. They're superimposed by man. And this is, this is the, nothing's new under the sun, by the way. This is, this is what went on in those days as well. So <clears throat> we're, here we have them uh, coming and saying, and one of the scribes came and, and, and having reasoning together, perceiving that he, might, he uh, I'm carrying on from verse 28 now, uh, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Now this man has seemed to, appeared to be, uh, at least on the surface, that he was very sincere in what he was saying. He wanted to know, because he, he was impressed by what he was hearing from the Lord. So Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it, is, is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There are no other commandments greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the soul and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. So here we have uh, the, the supremacy of God's word. He said, he said, if you love God supremely and uh, you don't willingly deny him in anything. Yeah, De Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 and 5. I'll look at that for a moment just to get some clarity on what I'm talking about here. Deuteronomy. Chapter 6. And... Verse 4 and 5. In Deuteronomy, when the law was given, this is the essence of the law. We go right from the very beginning of it, but I won't. It goes down to verse 4 and 5, and it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is, this is, is above all, this is, the, 
You see, the thing is with love, uh, if we read the Ten Commandments and we look through them, we begin to realize there's, a, there's an overriding uh, principle in all of the, the, the Ten Commandments, and that simply is love. If we love the Lord God with all our heart and all our strength, we've, we've, we've got our focus right. And then when you, you revert from that and you go to the actual uh, commandments themselves, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, the, all these kinds of things. When you do these kinds of things, you realize that if you love your neighbor as yourself, you wouldn't do these things. If you loved your neighbor really, you wouldn't be committing adultery with his wife, for instance. If you loved your neighbor, uh, you, you wouldn't go and steal what he has. And uh, you would covet what they have. These are the kinds of things that would happen if you truly loved with the kind of love that he's talking about here. So love is a principle. And why is it the principle? Because God is love. We certainly read that, don't we, very clearly in Ephesians. God is love. And if, he, if God is love, then we should exemplify that love in ourselves. And uh, it, that principle uh, rides over everything and everything that we do. Uh, we wouldn't do the kinds of things that we see happening in the world today if there was love. Of course, there's, there's no love lost in, in the Middle East or places like that today, is there? The hatred that we see and the, and the, the anger and all these things that are taking place, if these things were, were practiced as, as God taught us in the first place, we wouldn't see any of these kinds of things. But that is the principle that's, that not only is, is we see here now, but that's the principle that's going to be in glory. We're in glory. The, the, we're, the over, overriding everything is going to be the whole aspect of love. And real love. Not the kind of love you, you have for somebody if they give you something or if you get something out of, uh, you get a, a reciprocated. Love is something that just come, will come naturally for all of us in glory. Because we're in the presence of the one who is love. God is love. In every aspect of him. And this is, this is what we're going to see. So... Uh, we don't bear, uh, take vengeance or bear grudge against any of the children of your people. You shall. Uh, uh, this is Leviticus chapter 18, rather, and verse 18, talking about the love for others. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So this, this is the second principle. We written, read the one concerning the, the love of God, but now we have the love of, of man here. And this is what we're looking at here. And uh, so then the, the scribe says in verse 32, uh, so uh, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, but there is there is one God and no other but he. Well, that's, that's good. The scribe was actually, like I said, he was deeply impressed. He acknowledged the realization these rituals had absolutely no value in the sight of God if love is lacking. So if we gather at the temple and we slay the, the uh, various sacrifices or bring whatever the sacrifice, the grain offering, the, the, the drink offering, and all those kinds of things. If we bring these things and present them to the Lord, but there's no love in our hearts, they mean absolutely nothing. It's the same thing could apply today in our, in our churches. We can come and do all the right things, say all the right things, talk Christianese, all the kinds of things that we do. But if the love is not for our brother and sister in our heart, then it means nothing to God. Because God wants to see, uh, we're made in the image of God, remember. And if we're in the image of God, then we should be loving like God loves us. And we know how much he loved us to the point where he sent his son to die for us on the cross. So the man was not yet in the kingdom. And he was sort of like just outside the door. And to step in would mean he would have to see, receive Jesus for himself. And he wasn't prepared to do that. And uh, we just, we, how many people get this close? They get, they, they close, get to the point where they, they clearly understand what the requirements are, uh, clearly understand what, how God's uh, view of what we are. Uh, we're sinners before him. And we need, see the thing is, until we repent of our sins, acknowledge the fact that we have a need because of our sins, we're never going to be uh, candidates for glory. The, the only way we can do that is we, when you recognize you need a Savior and recognize that and ask Christ to come into your heart and, and uh, thank he, thanking him for his salvation. That's the only time that you're ever going to see the, 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 the golden streets of heaven. So, you know, when, when we see these things, we think of all the people, well, I've been baptized. I've talked to people about this, too. And they, you know, well, I've been baptized, you know. Well, what does that mean? You're just a wet sinner. You know, there's something else that's required, uh, you need. 
salvation. You need to acknowledge that you're a sinner before God. And you need to receive Christ as your Savior. The moment you do that, you are saved. You're, you're a fam in the family of God. Your name is written down in glory. And uh, there's a, a day waiting when you'll stand before him and rejoice at, at seeing him. Right now, people don't want to see him at all. And this is what happened back in those days as well. They didn't want to see him. They weren't interested in what his message. They weren't interested in anything. They wanted to carry on status quo, thinking somehow the great Satan's lie, that everything's going to be the same like this forever. Until one day you look in the mirror and you say, who is that old guy? Oh, that's me. And you realize we're getting old. We're getting close to that time when we'll depart from here. Then what? And that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Then what? So we, we carry on and we get to uh, verse 35 now. And in verse 35, we, we see that then Jesus answered and said, now he's coming, he, he talked about the scribes and, and uh, this is the scribes carrying on as well as the Pharisees because the scribes and, and, and the Pharisees kind of hung out together. And uh, verse 35, then Jesus answered and said, well, he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said that by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make my enemies, your enemies, your footstool. Verse 37, therefore David said, call, himself calls him Lord. How then is he his son? And the common people heard him gladly. Oh, something they hadn't thought of. What's going on here? Well, it's very simple. It's, it, it's common knowledge, of course, in Israel that the Messiah would be the son of David. First Kings chapter 2, uh, we'll look at that for a moment. First Kings chapter 2 and verse 1. Now the days of David drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, and therefore, and prove yourself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may be prosper in all the things, in all that you do, wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his word, which he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons take heed to their way, to walk before me in the truth and with their heart and with all their soul, he said, you shall not lack a man on the throne of David, or of Israel, brother. And then down to verse 34. Then Benaniah, the son of Joadiah, uh, went up and struck him and killed him, and he was buried in his own house in the wilderness. And the king put Benaniah, the son of Jehoiadai, in his place over the army, and the king put Zadok, the king, in the place of Abiathar. So we, we see that what we're, what's going on here is that uh, it always had to be a king, a king in the line that would come, and they knew that. There was other scriptures too, but they were ignoring one, and that was the, the Psalm 110. In Psalm 110, we see something that they, were, they weren't thinking of. Now, they knew about these, these, these uh, 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 scriptures, but they were ignoring this one. And in Psalm 110, the Lord's going to show him now that the Messiah, whom David was, had spoken, uh, and how then could the, such a one be David's son? Well, it says here in verse 110, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord said shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the, in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many nations, the countries. He shall drink by the brook, by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up 
your head. So here, he, here it very clearly says that uh, if, if uh, the Lord showed them that he, Messiah, it was Messiah of whom David had spoken, how then could such a one be David's son? Well, we know simply because the Lord Jesus existed long before David ever came on this earth. So Jesus is both the son of David as to his humanity and the son of God as to his divine nature and begotten of a virgin without a human father. The whole mystery is wrapped up in this quotation from this particular psalm. So we see they, they had to think about this for a moment. Hey, wait a minute, how could that be? Why, why would he say that uh, the Lord says, says to my Lord? And, start, and they start reasoning it through, and they think, well, then he has to be the God of David. That's the way it has to work. I didn't want to hear that. So they, we know that uh, the struggles went on for these people. So he, he put them to uh, uh, silence them on, on these issues. So then it goes on and it says, uh, he gives a warning here now in verse 38. He says, then he said to them in his teaching, beware of the scribes. These are the ones he's just been talking about. Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, Love greetings in the marketplace, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at the feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers, these will receive greater condemnation. That's quite a, quite, quite a statement to make, isn't it? These, these ones who thought they were so religious, and yet we see what, they're, they're, what they were actually practicing. Because of the, the, the stature they had in the community, they were doing things that... Uh, uh, they're taking the women and what they, apparently what they would do is they had money and these widows uh, when they, they died and if they, they were in trouble what they would do is they would borrow money from the, these scribes and the scribes would charge them exorbitant uh, 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 interest on these things to the point where they, they lost everything and they took what the, these widows had this is the kind of love that they had but then at the same time they would, they would stand in, in the, the public places and make these long prayers and sound very pious. Uh, we see that happen so much even today in, in many uh, uh, places. When you see this kind of stuff going on, you realize that there's a lot of hypocrisy. And this is the hypocrisy that, that is, uh, stumbles a lot of people, a lot of the ordinary people in this world. When they see the hypocrisy that, of so-called uh, religious people, and they see what's going on in the, in the extraction of money from people. Uh, the doctrine of purgatory came into being because uh, uh, when the widows would die, uh, they would be told, the widows would be told that their, their uh, husbands were in purgatory and they had to be prayed out. And uh, how, do you, how do you get out of there? Well, uh, we can get you out, but it's gonna take a lot of prayers. Well, how does that work? Well, if you give us so much money, we can get busy and start praying for them and get them out of purgatory. And this is where the do doctrine of purgatory came from. So this is, this is how the, the, the whole church got richer and richer and richer because they were extracting all the money from these, these, these widows. Now, this is the same kind of thing that was going on here. By the way, there's no such thing as purgatory. It doesn't exist anywhere in scripture. It's not even alluded to. But this was, this was a way by which these poor widows were being uh, robbed of their wealth. And it's, it's a sad commentary of, of the hearts of men, especially people who claim to know God. So in this kind of thing, we see what, what's going on here. And then he, then, he, then he gets to this last little section here. And uh, this little section here is very interesting. It's in verse 41 down to the end. It says, now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury and how, how were the, uh, uh, many were, who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which is uh, makes a, a, a quatrain. So he called the, his disciples to him himself and said, surely I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are given to the treasury. For all they, they put all of their, uh, out, of, out of all their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had her whole livelihood. Now that doesn't mean she gave every single cent she had, but it's obviously her livelihood, when it speaks of that, it talks about her day's wages, what she'd made in that day. She came by the, the, the temple and she threw the whole thing in. And uh, you know what's, what's wonderful about this? Who's watching? 
Who is watching? You know, it's amazing. She came with a, a pure heart and she and gave to the Lord and uh, she gave everything she had out of love. And God was watching. You know, that's just what happens. You know, we seem to think that uh, no matter what we do, somehow we're doing things in the corner and nobody can see it, including God. God can see everything. He can see your heart. And how does he measure our giving? Well, he simply doesn't, he doesn't go by like this. And this is she gave all that she had, which was nothing really compared to what other people were throwing in. But he didn't measure by how much the others put in. He measured by how much they had left. And see, this was, the, this was really the, the key to whether they were giving with a whole heart. Now, we know that we, we, uh, we're told in scriptures to give as the Lord has prospered you. And uh, everybody gives differently. We, we know that some teach that you're supposed to give 10% or whatever it is. Uh, that, that may not work for everybody. But scriptures clearly tell us that we are to lay up in treasure, uh, lay up in store for those on the, on the first day of the week. And we give as the Lord has prospered us. So it's, we're given out of love, not out of compulsion, not out of because you have to give, not because you have to sign. And I know some uh, do this where they, when you uh, become a, a church member, uh, one of the things you do is you sign a, a document that says you'll give so much. This is totally wrong. This is not what the, the, the scriptures teach. So in this, in this matter, uh, we see very clearly that this woman gave out of a, 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 a pure heart. And this is not to put the guilt on anybody around here. That's not what I'm saying. I'm, sim I'm simply saying when anybody gives, they give uh, to the Lord. They don't give to the church. They don't give to, and they give to the Lord. And the Lord knows how much you can give and how much you can't give and how much you hold back and how much and all, all the rest of it. So in this particular case, he gives a wonderful uh, 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 example of what giving is all about. And then he reverts, you see, he's reverting back to these, these scribes and what they were doing. They were, they were in this for all of, all of what they could get out of a religion, not what they could give to it. And uh, we see the total difference in all of these things. So as we uh, close with this, I just pray that uh, this will help us. So we see these religious people, we had the, we had the Herodians, we had the, the Sadducees, we had the Pharisees, and we had the scribes. Each one of them hated each other. But when it came time to deal with the Lord Jesus, they banded together because they hated the Lord more. And that's a sad commentary, and we see that happening in the world today. We see some of the countries in the Middle East, they have totally different views on, on their religion and all the rest of it. But they have one common enemy, and that's Israel. They hate Israel because they hate God. And that, that's it's, it's as simple as we can put it. So we see the same kind of thing taking place uh, today as we see that. A lot of these things that we're looking at today are just things that we can apply to what's happening today. Nothing, there's nothing new under the sun. So when we see these things, we realize that uh, we're on the victory side with the, with the one who is in control of everything. So I just pray that this will that help some as we went through this particular portion of scripture. And uh, we'll just close in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the time that we've spent in the word here and the lessons we can learn from what is religion. And uh, we know that... Uh, Simple faith is what you're looking for. Simple love is what you're looking for. If we think of the examples given in all of these things, and it comes down to the same thing. You're a God of love, and, and we're going to be in a place of love. And to develop that attitude of love while we're here in, in this place uh, called uh, the temporal earth, uh, the closer we are to glory when we get there. We know that uh, when we walk, step into glory and we see you, the better we got to know you, down here, the better we'll know you when we see you there. We won't be strangers. So Lord, we just uh, thank you now for the time we spent in your word as we continue for the rest of this day. We ask you to bless the meeting tonight, bless the gospel tonight, and bless uh, Dale as he brings a message. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.